Magandang <laughs> uh, umaga. Ako ay overwhelmed sa presence ng mga nararamdaman ko mga vibes this morning. Uh, Magandang. Ding, ano na lang. Sige, I cannot mention everybody I see, although I know a lot of them, and I am awed to be in their presence. Uh, we have, of course, uh, Chief Justice Hilario Davide. We have, uh, magandang na lang, si Sister Mary Chan. Manansan, we have, um, uh, Christian Monson, attorney Christian Monson, we have Erwin Tanyana, we have uh, Kamsa Tour, estudyante ko, si Mary Colmenares, patinsya niya na kita. We have many others. Um, sadly, the Dean cannot make it today to extend her welcoming arms because uh, she has a uh, priorly set appointment. Uh, I am here merely to welcome you to this bastion of overwhelming ideas. Um, the law sector is currently, well, was currently and will always be, uh, immersed in research uh, of national issues. Kung saan natin pwedeng gamitin kung, kung ano man ang aming mga masasaliksik para sa mga pangangailangan natin. We've been involved in research uh, on cha uh, cha, whether or not uh, we should have one, or whether or not there are certain points of amendments that uh, we saw a lot of people like to talk about. And we don't say yes or no, not yet anyway, until we have fully, um, we have fully seen the scope uh, of, uh, well, of the change or the, end, uh, the consequences of whatever change or changes. So please feel free to uh, shout your heart's content, your mind's content, and burst with all the ideas uh, in this place called the Malcolm Hall, the UP Law Center, where all these ideas perhaps were, uh, as uh, Carol and I were discussing earlier, minsan dito nag-uumpisa, minsan dito rin natatapos yung ibang mga pananaw. Minsan sa classroom pa lang, pagpasok mo lang, first year sa law school, eh alam mo na kung saan dapat pumunta o saan hindi dapat pumunta ang ibang mga, mga kalagayan dito sa ating uh, ipunan. And with that, we welcome you with, uh, with a big heart with super fondness, with pleasure, and with all, with, our, with all our honor. Welcome po sa inyong lahat. Pero bago po kayo mag-react, pwede yung yung mga nakatayo, relax lang tayo, magpapakot na yung upuan. Dahil <laughs> medyo, meron din po yata tayo, kaya po, na uh, mga monitors sa labas, kung saan maglalagay yung tayo ng upuan, para makita nyo yung mga nagpapakot. So um, with that, we are going to try to make everything as uh, comfortable for you and as open so we can say anything and everything. Remember, this is the UP College for the UP Law So welcome home. ang isang convener ng Movement Against Tyranny, si Sister Mary Chong. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Nakakataba po ng puso, nakakatawa po makita kayong lahat dito na talagang uh, nakikita natin ang pagpupusigin natin para sa ating bayan. Bakit po tayo nandito? Kasi po ang tingin ko, nasa isang very critical situation po tayo ngayon. Kung naalaala po ninyo yung historia ng Rwanda na nagkaroon ng parang mass hypnotism, yung pong mga pumatay ng kanilang mga kapibahay na preso sila, na isang researcher na na bumisita sa kanila at tinanong sa kanila, how could you do that? How could you kill your your neighbor? Ang sabi ko nung mga nasa preso, nag-glaze ang eyes nila, we don't know, but an evil wind 
pass over our land. What I can say is that wind is not only passing over our land, it is hovering over our land. And I'm sure you also know the, that the Germans are supposed to be the most rational people in the world. They were deluded into thinking that this installation where there is a mark on the gate says Arbeit macht frei, which means work makes free, was not a real factory, but was the gas chambers where six million Jews were, as a, were uh, gassed and put to death. That is this idea, this, this concept, or this phenomenon of mass delusion, I believe is with us. There are still many people in our country today who are deluded, who are having a kind of mass hypnotism, and that is so dangerous. It makes our atmosphere such a toxic atmosphere that is so contagious that it has con contaminated many people and, and especially our government officials. So why are we here? We are here because we want, first of all, clarification. Because what I see now, with all the contradictory statements of the people in the government, they want to confuse us because the effect of confusion is inaction. That's why we need clarity. And we have resource persons here who will really explain to us what are the issues, what are the alternatives, what are the possibilities, and I think that will give us the clarity. And when we have clarity, then we can unite, we can really put together all our efforts and our struggle because for me, this is the time when really people's power is needed. And that is one thing that the Chacha wants to take away from us, the people power. And we know that that is necessary because there are times when there is no other resort but that. So there are so many threats to our, our, to our life as Filipino people. I always repeat this and I would like to repeat it again. What I see is a terrible erosion of our moral fiber as people. Where there is no longer any respect for people, no longer respect for, for life, no respect for truth, no respect for, for any behavioral code of ethics, no respect for law. And that is the one now that we are going to tackle. This disrespect for our law and our constitution. And I hope after this um, assembly, when we have all the clarifications that we need, that I hope that we would really all unite as one people. And we are going to show to this government that we are not in agreement with what they are doing and railroading us into, into accepting what we do not want to accept. So I would like to wish you all a very fruitful morning and I hope that this is only the beginning of our coming together as a brave and courageous people. Thank you very much. the Constitution, and which the hope uh, will be the first step to the formation of a broad national coalition against Chatsa, to be known later on as North to Chatsa Coalition. I cannot say no to the invitation. For one, the event uh, brings me back to this Malcolm Hall, which was one of my favorite places of learning law in a grand manner for four solid years in the College of Law, together with Chris Monster here. 
you can read uh, this much about law in a grand manner. Second, <coughs> and more importantly, this forum provides uh, me another historic moment to solemnly repeat once more my solemn pledge. This is the Constitution I am willing to die for. I made this pledge when I explained my yes vote to the draft of the 1987 Constitution at the plenary session of the 1996 Constitutional Commission held on 12 October 1986 with Chris Monson. I was a member of that commission who submitted various uh, constitutional reform proposals and innumerable amendments which uh, were incorporated in various provisions of the present constitution. I repeated that pledge many times in the past uh, several weeks. I say it again before you this morning. I am here with you to express my full uh, solidarity with you and my unconditional and unqualified support for your heroic and patriotic stand against the tough change that the administration is trying to rush to approve. Just to the shift to federalism alone, I have said that it is a lethal experiment, a fatal leap, a plunge to death, and a leap to hell. Edmund Burke, the Irish-born politician and man of letters, once said, bad laws are the worst kind of tyranny. That ship alone to federalism <coughs> would impose upon us not just a bad law, but the worst constitution. That would be more than tyranny of bad laws. My friends, that is only on federalism. Before the House of Representatives now are three separate proposals known as Constitution for the Federal Republic of the Philippines, which carry other changes, such as the adoption of the parliamentary form of government, the term extensions of the current elected officials, the lifting of term limits, the removal of the citizenship requirements, in the patrimony and economic provisions of the Constitution, especially on exploitation, development, and utilization of our natural resources. <coughs> As I shall hereafter point out, the long and short of the rush to chapter change at this time is tyranny. I submit that logic, reason, and even primitive common sense require or remind that before we embark on chapter change, we have to consider some fundamental questions whose answers would constitute the prior conditions. First, is there a need to amend or revise the 1987 Constitution? The question presupposes or assumes that the one proposing the amendments or revision must first of all know the Constitution and must have a full grasp of the contents of the spirit, values, and principles which are its cornerstones and have found them, or some of them, to be stumbling blocks to what the sovereign Filipino people, invoking the aid of Almighty God, prayed for in the preamble of the Constitution, the building of a just and human society, and uh, the establishment of a government that shall embody their ideas and aspirations, promote the common good, conserve and develop the national patrimony, and secure to themselves the blessings of posterity and democracy under the rule of law, under the regime of truth, justice, freedom, love, equality, and peace. More specifically, before entertaining any thought of amending or revising the Constitution, our lawmakers and leaders should first meticulously read the Constitution, examine all provisions, and reflect on them with objective discernment. 
thereafter, we should ask themselves, have we taken enough steps to give life to or implement the provisions and the mandates of the Constitution? If they have not, or they have done just a little, they should not allow themselves to be a party to the mangling or tinkering of the Constitution. Let the proponents of such a change answer this question honestly. Our president should be reminded that before he entered on the execution of his office on 30 June 2016, he took the constitutionally mandated of office prescribed in Section 5 of Article 7 of the Constitution, wherein, invoking the heart of God, he solemnly pledged, swore to, among others, preserve and defend the Constitution. Preserve and defend the Constitution. Our senators and representatives and all other officials of the government upon assumption of office, also took an oath, likewise invoking the aid of God to, among others, uphold and defend the Constitution and to bear true faith and allegiance to it. Thus, unless our leaders have done the prerequisites and answered affirmatively the questions I had enumerated, under the first precondition, this should not entice our people, a vast majority of whom do not even know the Constitution and do not want it amended or revised. We have been informed of a recent survey result that only 27 of our people know about our Constitution. And likewise, the survey shows that the vast majority of our people are not in favor of amending the Constitution. Second, the proponents of charter change must exactly know or fully grasp what is it that they want to put into or add to the Constitution to make it more effective or responsive. In substitution for or that had been perceived to be inadequate in the Constitution. For instance, and more specifically, the change of the system of government from the present unitary to that of the federal, which is the current uh, obsession of the leadership. Do they know what federalism is, and how it works, and whether it is suited for the Filipino people and for the Philippines? Let all proponents of charter change honestly respond to that. I very respectfully submit that there is absolutely no need to amend or revise the 1987 Constitution. And if there is at all, federalism should never be adopted because of the evils it breeds. Of the five constitutions the Philippines ever had, the Malolos Constitution, the 1935 Constitution, the 1973 Constitution, the Freedom Constitution of 1986, and the 1987 Constitution, only the 1987 Constitution has remained unamended for 31 years. Just 2 February 2018, it celebrated its third first year. Two previous uh, attempts to amend it had failed. You remember that in 1997, during the term of President Fidel Ramos, <coughs> there was a proposal by way of a People's Initiative, third mode of proposing amendments under the Constitution, to lift the term limits of elected officials. The principal reason or objective was to allow President Ramos to run for election in the elections of May 1998. Under Section 4 of Article 7 of the Constitution, the President shall not be eligible for any re-election. The People's Initiative Proposal was filed for Suman to Republic Act 7.35. 
the initiative and the final referendum law. But the Supreme Court is uh, 19 uh, March 1997 decision in Santiago versus Commission on Elections declared that the law was as ordered was incomplete and insufficient for purposes that the people's initiative to propose amendments. Hence the proposal was struck down. Then during the time of President Gloria Macapa Arroyo, a second attempt was made. The purpose was to allow her to continue in office after serving the white uh, the presidency by adopting the parliamentary form, because if it is formed, it is adopted, uh, eventually she will be able to run for Congress and be elected as Prime Minister and therefore hold on to office afterward. Uh, the Supreme Court has struck that down again. In short, uh, the 1987 Constitution has achieved an unsurpassed record of permanence. As explained by Justice Isagrani Cruz in his book, Constitutional Law, permanence means the capacity of the Constitution, open code, to resist capricious and whimsical changes dictated not by legitimate needs but only by passing <coughs> passes, temporary passions, or occasional infatuations of the people with ideas or personalities. I would not hesitate to assert that our Constitution, the 1987 Constitution, even if imperfect, as man is perfect except God, is the best in the world. The best for our country and our people, not just of our generations, but even for generations yet unborn. It is the only constitution I know of which is pro-God, pro-Filipino, pro-people, pro-life, pro-family, pro-marriage, pro poor, pro pro-social justice, pro-human rights, pro-women, pro-environment, among many others. It contains sufficient provisions against abuse of power and guarantees people's active initiative participation in governance, including the use of people power. It is the only constitution in the world which institutionalizes uh, the doctrine that the public office is a public trust, meaning that all government officials and employees are servants of the people, thereby enshrining servant leadership principle which Jesus Christ himself had proclaimed. I have yet to see another constitution which could surpass our present constitution. I know this constitution very well, just like this one, so, because uh, we were part of its country. Unfortunately, massive majority of its provisions have not been implemented. There are millions of, millions of provisions which require appropriate legislations to give life to them. The government and Congress are expressly mandated to do so and the mandate is repeated about 150 times. And yet, only a little of the Constitution has been implemented. The irretrievable conclusion then is, there is nothing in the 1987 Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines which can stand amendment or a vision at this time. The Constitution is the political Bible of our people and of our country, which is not touching at this time. Let me now turn to the shift to federalism, which, as I said earlier, is a lethal experiment. A fatal leap, he plans to death, a leap to hell. As I said, unfortunately, nothing can and nobody may be able to, except the people, is stop the pursuit of this obsession or infatuation to adopt the federal system. This is especially true in the lower house, 
of super maturity with the superb ability of the leadership can easily take the bullet train to reach at the soonest possible time to the final destination of adopting a new constitution. What our country and our people need today is not a change of the constitution by adopting the federal system. What are needed are, first, authentic and genuine change in the hearts and minds and values of our leaders to the end that they be truly genuine, authentic public servants or servant leaders. Second, that same kind of virtual change in our people, that they be at all times vigilant and assertive and uh, true and responsible members of uh, this uh, government, but especially in these times of fake news, false news, and post news. To paraphrase the book of Sirach concerning sin, federalism is a two-edged uh, sword. When it cuts, that can be no healing. The federal system is definitely not suited to our country and our people of our generation and the end. It cannot fit into our history, character, culture, traditions, beliefs, hopes, aspirations and longings, and even our idiosyncrasies and peculiarities. The best suited for us is the unitary system, which has proven itself to be so. Federation federalism cannot fit into our training and experiences in the art of politics, government, and governance. Only very few of our people have experienced how that system works. There are the very few who have lived and worked in federal states like the U.S. and Canada. Untried and untested in our country and by our people, since we have attained our independence of God, June 1998, or even before that, federalism would be a foreign invader or a stranger. It could come not on its own conquering will and without gifts of gold, frankincense, or beer. It would come at a reckless and imprudent instance, instigated only by a few. It would come to us, us in a way that is anomalous, the procedure anomalous, being that we are dividing our country instead of delegate way of promoting a federal system, which should be the incorporation of several sovereign states. The principal reasons are used for federalism, that is to give more power to the local government units, is uh, and convincing. What we need is only to amend the local government code. Because Article 10 of our Constitution provides for the enactment of a local government code responsive to the needs of our people. If anything is uh, needed here, simply amend that code. As envisioned in the three drafts of the Constitution now in the lower house, for federal system to be adopted, you have to divide the country into various regions or states, sovereign in itself. In the Pimentel proposal, into 12 states. In the Guevara and uh, uh, Gonzalez proposal, Guevara rather, 18 regions. And in the Federal Institute of the PDP 11, the number is yet to be determined and yet it is to be by privacy. All of this would mean, therefore, the disfiguring of our country, the, the dividing of our country into several parts. And what would happen with this? One, to divide our people and cultivate them, force double loyalties. You will have two flags, the federal flag and the state flag, Right now, you have only one flag here, when we sang the national anthem. 
further. Second, it would create a horrible, enlarged, and bloated bureaucracy that would be due to the establishment of new layers of strata of government authority or seats of power, central and the various component states or regions. Third, this enlarged bloated bureaucracy would be completely anti good inevitably and unavoidably. They would be burdened with more taxes of all kinds to support and maintain the separate states or regions and federal government on the other hand. Fourth, the enlarged bloated bureaucracy carries with it the creation of more juicy elective positions which will guarantee fortune, fame, and power to certain politicians and their families. We shall have more political dynasties of a different state. Five, I heard it before, and I say it now. The federalism is not the one actually erected by a winding in the Constitution. What is erected would be feudalism. Indeed, the proliferation of political dynasties would increase the number of feudal states or regions. My good friend here, Chris Monson, mentioned one time that our Philippines is already is still a feudalistic dominated ruling class that rotates among themselves the levels of power through changes in administration. The fact is, it continued, only 1% of the families make the laws, the special justice, implement programs, and control media. Six, federalism breeds political dynasties and creates feudal societies would make democracy at risk. In his latest book, Understanding Philippine Society and Cultural Politics, the noted sociologist Professor Randy Lewin said, the reign of a few political dynasties, even if legitimized by elections, goes against the idea of democracy, viewed against the exigencies of today's complex societies. Political succession on the basis of layers has got to be one of the biggest sources of social dysfunction. Seven, the large bloated bureaucracy under the system with feudalism and political dynasties provide the greatest temptation to keep and maintain private armies and ensure perpetuation of power and warlordism therefore will simply follow. Eight, federalism will create thousands of new positions, non-elective positions, which will be filled up by thousands of war bodies whose main credentials will be loyalty to politicians. This horrible enlarged bureaucracy would further widen the grounds and opportunities for massive graft and corruption because new offices vulnerable to graft and corruption would swap such as those for public works and infrastructure projects and the issuances of permits and licenses. Even the conduct of free elections will be affected. Under the federal system, even the criminal justice system will be affected. And then uh, you will also see even the courts will be affected. Finally, Federalism would be a monstrous burden even to the business sector. The proliferation of political dynasty will make life for businessmen more difficult. In doing business, you will have to deal with several layers of strata of sovereign authority. They will pay more taxes. They can be victims of more graft and corruption. Worse yet, more shady politicians and more political dynasties can own and harass them no end during the seasons. They and their families and cohorts, dummies or nominees, can put up their own businesses and destroy business centers.
let us all pray that our pro-federation federalism senators and representatives and all their leaders will hearken to their conscience. Conscience, according to Meccan, is the inner voice which warns us that someone may be looking. Or according to Corinthians, who did before Christ, there is no witness so dreadful, no accuser so terrible, as the conscience that dwells in the heart of everyone. All told, therefore, a ship to federalism is term. And for those who took the oath of an assumption of office to preserve and defend the Constitution, or to uphold and defend the Constitution and to bear true faith and allegiance to it, to now lure and entice our people to agree to and approve the federal system is to commit tyranny and injustice to our country and our people. Go forth, therefore, my friends, to our people, and let your light illumine them against the evils of chapter change. May you love for them on Valentine's Day, move their hearts to reject chapter change. Tomorrow is Ash Wednesday, the start of the Lenten season. May the proponents of chapter change decide and reflect more on the evils of chapter change, such that come Easter Sunday, they would have a change of heart for our people in our country. God bless the Philippines. Since my favorite Chief Justice has already covered very ably the principle of the issues on federalism, I will try not to duplicate his presentation. Why charter change? The articulated purpose of the proposed charter change by the temporary administration is the same as the six previous failed attempts to improve the quality of life of Filipinos, especially the poor. But it appears to have more traction than previous attempts because of the high trust ratings of the president, despite deepening reservations about extrajudicial killings and other governance issues. Among the candidates in the last elections, Duterte the mayor alone read, collect, read correctly the deepest yearnings of our people for a leader who can be an agent for change. So they left the mainstream to elect him by a huge plurality. And the question is, can Duterte the president make good on his promise through democratic ways? We can only ignore the sentiment behind the vote for him at the peril of undertaking the wrong solutions. The PDP Laban Federal Constitution summarizes the reason for their proposal. Quote, our system of government has resulted in a grave imbalance in the distribution of resources among regions and local government units. The problem is, a bit, is our highly centralized form of government and the solution we believe is the adoption of a federal system. We believe that the only way to bring about equitable and widespread development in our country is for the central government to share power, political and economic, with the regions and the local government units." Unquote. The president characterizes the problem as Imperial Manila. The question begs to be asked, is federalization a Trojan horse to the establishment of an authoritarian regime? A book released just last month on how democracy die, democracies die cites that changes in government during the Cold War was done through military coup d'etats, but thereafter by duly elected leaders who want to become dictators. The book posits the signs to watch out for, any one of which should be a source of concern. One, 
he or he rejects in words or actions the democratic rules of the game. B. Two. <clears throat> he denies the legitimacy of opponents. Three. Tolerates or encourages violence. And four. Indicates a willingness to curtail the civil liberties of opponents, including the media. Four. Which one? Very often, a litmus test for authoritarianism are populist outsiders, anti-establishment politicians waging war on a corrupt and conspirational elite. The Duterte agenda for charter change appears to consist of the following, as reflected in the PDP Laban draft constitution. First, a shift to a federal system of government. Second, a shift from a presidential to a parliamentary system. Third, the central theme of social justice and human rights in the 1987 Constitution is replaced by the themes of business, which advocates foreign direct investments by transferring the power to regulate foreign ownership from the Constitution to the Congress itself. Fourth, a weakening of the check and balance system of the government in the increasing concentration of power in the executive, especially during the long transition period of about 11 and a half to 12 years. Does this agenda address the problems of Imperial Manila and of the uneven and inequitable development? The answer is no, for the following reasons. Why? If that is so necessary, why is there no mention at all of federal or parliamentary in the Philippine Development Plan 2017 to 2022 and Ambition 2014? Two, on transferring the power to regulate foreign direct investments from the Constitution to the Congress, the facts belie the arguments against ownership limitations. Three, the downgrading of social justice as a compelling principle of the Constitution is exactly the opposite of what should be done to address the core problems of mass poverty and gross inequalities in our country. Four, Imperial Manila is primarily, primarily a problem of what they call fiscal decentralization or the devolution of power and resources to the local government units which fiscal experts say can be done without federalization. The context of this day. EDSA was the inspiration of our constitution and the peaceful restoration of democracy. EDSA was more than that. To the poor, it was the promise of a new social order with radical changes, but through democratic means. The 1987 Constitution was the first time that we spoke to the world as a truly independent and democratic Filipino nation. It is a document that had not been imposed on us by any colonial power or by a dictator. We, we could have completely overhauled our system and form of government. But in our national consultations before we wrote the Constitution, the people overwhelmingly prefer the stability of familiar structures, a democratic representative presidential system with checks and balances and separation of powers. The Constitution also innovated with three central themes. Firstly, the heart of the Constitution is social justice and human rights, with the poor as a center of development. Secondly, never again to any authoritarian government. Hence, the strict limitations and conditions for declaring martial law, which provisions, unfortunately, have been compromised by the two recent Supreme Court decisions on its proclamation and on its extension for one year. Thirdly, the national destiny must firmly and safely rest on Filipinos themselves. Never again amendments similar to the 1935 Constitution 
that gave Americans equal rights to our patrimony and foreign military bases and economic policies where even our exchange rate after independence would not be changed without the approval of the U.S. President. The Constitution also cut the umbilical cord of the 1935 and 1973 constitutions to the United States Constitution, which gives primary, primary primacy to civil and political rights because it is a country of immigrants who all started from the same position and only wanted to be free from autocracy. Our Constitution gives social and economic rights equal primacy with civil and political rights because we are a country of inequalities from the colonial days to the present where the starting positions of the rich and the poor are not equal. Social justice is about the adjustment of the starting positions. To fulfill that promise, the state can use its police power such as income distribution programs, primarily quality education and quality health care, and asset distribution programs for the poorest of the poor, agrarian reform, urban land reform and housing, ancestral domain and fisheries reform. This is the constitution that the Duterte administration wants to overhaul. 30 years after EDSA, we still have mass poverty and one of the highest inequality in our part of the world. The world, the social reform programs are underperforming and the social divides have not changed. In fact, I submit that the biggest divide among our peoples is not culture or identity or territory. The biggest divide between the rich and the poor. Whether among Christians, Muslims and indigenous peoples, communities, or within the nations at home, or among regions. The only clear cases where there are common and distinctive historical, cultural heritage, and economic and social structures are Muslim Mindanao and the indigenous peoples of the Cordilleras. They are also the peoples who refuse to yield to any colonial master. We celebrate their principles and their heroism with a special autonomy provided by the Constitution, which are not yet fulfilled. Yet federalism is being proposed for the whole country as if there are similar deep divides among us. When I organized NAMFREL before the elections in 1986, I went to 55 provinces. I did not meet any deep divides. What I met was solidarity in restoring democracy in our country. The fact is that what we have is a failure of development defined as sustained high growth rate plus equitable distribution. Let me read what the UNDP says. Human development is the process that widens the range of people's choices to lead a long and healthy life, to be educated and knowledgeable, and to enjoy a decent standard of living. It includes political freedom, guaranteed human rights, and self-respect. We are told that certain factors account for our laggardness on human development. Initial conditions, natural resources, geography, democracy, demography. But foremost of all, flawed policies and weak institutions. This is a study of the Asian Development Bank headed by Jeffrey Sachs. And most of all, weak institutions and flawed policies that are rooted in a feudalistic system that has been impervious to change for generations and its companion evil, corruption. Let me quote what was said of us. Perhaps in no other country in South Asia is political dishonesty so widely recognized, accepted, and talked about as part of the political game. That was Gunnar Birdal in the Asian drama in 1968. And 45 years later, in 2013, and I quote, 
The Philippines, in short, has never moved on from the colonial era, era and the patterns of amoral elite dominance that it created. George Stadwell, How Asia Works, 2013. The Philippine Development Plan. If federal parliamentary system is critical to our future, why is there no mention of it at all in the Philippine Development Plan 2017 to 2022 and Ambition 2040? In launching that, may I quote the press release. On October 11, 2016, President Rodrigo R. Duterte signed Executive Order No. 5 Series of 2016 approving and adopting the 25-year long-term vision entitled Ambition in 2040 as a guide for development planning, according to the EO5. The Philippine Development Plan 2017-2022 and succeeding development plans until 2040 shall be anchored on Ambition 2040. The EO5 recognizes the need for a bold vision and effective development planning based on a forward-looking approach that goes beyond a single administration. It also emphasizes the quality of people in development planning and their aspirations as requisite for the design of government intervention to achieve development outcomes. There is no mention that federalism and parliamentarism are necessary to achieve the PDP uh, goals, which have year-to-year -year targets and about 300 targets. In other words, the design of government intervention to achieve development outcomes does not require a shift to a federal parliamentary system. How does the Philippine Development Plan plan to address the uneven development among the regions. The plan espouses in Chapter 3 a National Spatial Strategy or NSS that recognizes among other things the very unequal distribution of production and income of the Philippines among its regions with three regions and MCR, Alapar Zone and Central Luzon responsible for contributing 63% of the country's gross domestic product. Obviously, the other regions cannot support themselves. The rest of Luzon accounts for 10.3, Visayas 12.4, and Mindanao 14.5 shares in the gross domestic product. The NSS, National Spatial Strategy, aims to decongest NCR and direct growth in key centers throughout the country and seeks to redress spatial and socio-economic inequalities by linking lagging regions with leading regions, rather than advocating the uniform dispersal of development that can create diseconomies and inefficiencies. The NSS just forms a network of settlements, even across political boundaries, to maximize the benefits of what economists call economic agglomeration. This is how the Philippine Development Plan, through the National Special Strategy addresses the problem of unequal development in our country. There is another dimension to the agglomeration approach. The Philippine Human Development Report, 2012-2013, points out that human development is about the welfare of people, not the development of places. The nature of economic development is uneven. It's not about bringing jobs to people, but closing the distance between the people and the jobs by giving the people the capability and mobility to choose where to go. But the principle is different when it comes to quality education and quality health care. Breaking the vicious cycle of the poverty of the young means bringing the services to them wherever they are, regardless of the cost. This is what human development is about. Social justice and the economy in the PDP Laban Draft Constitution. 
The PDP 11 version of the Constitution is very disappointing because PDP 11 was very much a part of EDSA. Why is it pushing for a federal parliamentary system which they admit does not directly but only indirectly address the twin problems of mass poverty and gross inequalities that is central to a new social order? Why not? do it directly by fully implementing the laws and programs of the social justice. Moreover, PDP Laban delegated the rewriting of Article 12 on the economy and Article 13 on social justice, on human rights, to the Foundation for Economic Freedom, a think tank of the academy and business. Some of them may be here. <laughs> the result is that the social justice provisions in Article 12 and Article 13 have been replaced by the themes of business. In other words, social justice is no longer a compelling principle of the Constitution, but is just another means to economic growth, like globalization, free trade, market-driven solutions, international competitiveness, increased foreign direct investments. Article 13 on social justice and human rights has the most deletions of provisions. Um, there are about other than the articles, of course, of uh, legislature and executive. Because the Foundation for Economic Freedom proposed that labor, agrarian reform, urban land reform, and housing are better left to the discretion of guess who? Okay. The Congress. <laughs> Doesn't PDP Laban know that social justice is in the, in the Constitution for a purpose? And the purpose is to correct the injustices to the poor by through centuries of our country. Doesn't PDP Laban know? that if they remove social justice as a central theme of the Constitution, they will be held to pay from the poor. As my dead colleague Heidi Ora of this great law school always says, let justice be done, though the heavens fall. Article 12, the references in the Constitution to such principles as distributive justice, the use of property bears a social function, industrialization based on South agricultural development and agrarian reform have been deleted. About section, seven sections in all have been deleted and 18 sections have been revised, including reversing the priorities of the economy. These changes are based on the Foundation for the Economic Freedom proposal that land ownership, the use of natural resources, the operation of public utilities and the rules on media, advertising, and even education are better left to the yes, so, Congress. By simply adding the phrase, unless otherwise provided by law, at the end of the nine provisions in the six areas. My friend Mary over there describes this in more colorful language. They forget that delegating the issue of Filipino ownership to the Congress would open the door to transactional legislation at which the business community is most adept. The economic argument is that restrictions on foreign ownership stifle investment climate and competition, resulting in lost employment and growth opportunities, and that such restrictions and therefore anti-poor. This noble rhetoric is far from the truth. FDI, or foreign direct investment, is closer to what Professor Emeritus Michael Mayer of the Wharton School pointed out in an article in Business Day, in September 24, 2014, that the ethos of capitalism is you operate for your shareholders rather than for the whole people. I know this because I took my economics at the Wharton School. <laughs> but even with the kind of self-interest by business, 
What is the empirical evidence since the enactment of the 1987 Constitution and its limitations on foreign ownership? First, from 1960 to 2009, our average per capita real growth rate was a measly 1.58% a year, the lowest in our part of the world. But from 1988, <laughs> under the new constitution, we have been growing steadily at a faster trajectory than before. More importantly, from 2010 to 2017, our gross domestic product has grown at an average of 6.4% and per capita real income by 4.5% a year. That's a big jump from 1.58. That is higher than the growth rate of Thailand over the same period. Second, the Philippines has performed very well compared to its regional neighbors with the growth rate of 6.7% in 2017. It grew faster than the average of the East Asia countries and our ASEAN five neighbors. Only China, Vietnam, and Cambodia grew faster, 6.8 by 0.1% by difference. At that rate, it will be doubling our gross domestic product per capita every 15 years. And in, um, and then by another 50 years, we would have a per, per capita about six times of what we have now. Moreover, during the Pinoy administration, poverty incidents went down from about 25% to about 21%. Third, no wonder that the UNTA World Investment Report 2016 predicted that between 2016 and 2018, the Philippines is among the top 15 preferred investment destinations of foreign direct investments. We are in the same category as the US, China, India, Germany, Japan, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, Malaysia, France, Australia, Myanmar, and Vietnam. Two countries were bumped off from the top 15 list, namely Hong Kong and Singapore to make room for us in Myanmar, because both of us did not rank at all in 2014. And all this under the present constitution with a unitary form of government. What is all the screaming about federalism and the need to change the constitution and the pro-Filipino provisions of the constitution? It may well be that our growth might have been higher with a higher FDI. But that is different from saying that we need FDI badly and must adjust our standards to their demands. You may have, FDI may have a role to play in our development, but what counts is not the quantity, but the quality of the investment. According to the World Investment Report also, and other reports, the factors that affect investment decisions are adequate infrastructure, skill levels, quality of the general regulatory framework, clear rules of the game, fiscal determination, the relative absence of graft and corruption, and also criminality and political instability. The point is that, if we conscientiously attend to these factors, other factors, we may have more FBI, but on our terms. In fact, the World Bank does not put lifting restrictions on reserve areas for local control as a priority condition to attract FBI. They know that this is a fact of public policy in most developing countries, and more important, that it was also the policies of developed countries when they were themselves developing. Moreover, our country is already open for purposes of FDI in long-term land leases, mineral mining, in power generation and supply, and in many other areas of investment. What is the alternative to federalism? The local government code, although considered a landmark legislation, has turned out to be inadequate on devolution, and many of its provisions are not being implemented fully or correctly. 
There are acknowledged legal fiscal experts such as Professor Rosario Manasan of the UP, and former finance under Secretary Melinda Guevara, with instructive insights on the amendments to the local government code and other laws and reforms to devolve real powers to administratively capable NGOs, whether on education, health, infrastructure, raising their own funds or resources, that will enable them to achieve meaningful self-determination without the need of federalization. Manasan says also that the statement that the NCR is briefly receive a disproportionate share of national government spending is not the case. If you look at the National Capital Region, Region 3 and Region 4A, they receive less funds for expenditures relative to their contribution to the gross domestic public or population size. They also say that there are so-called devolved Listen to this, but this is about Port Palace, so you want to like this. Manasan cites how many so-called devolved national government agencies make full use of Section 17F of the Local Government Code and Executive Order 53 to justify their continuous involvement in the delivery of devolved services. This is when the Department of the Budget works with legislators directly rather than with development councils from the barangay up and which and this is the mother load of the port bottom. You remove that there's no port bottom. Manasan also cites the three national consultations in the Son Visayas and Mindanao in 2014 that resulted in a consensus of about 30 amendments to the fiscal provisions of the local government code. These amendments constitute most of the fiscal reforms needed against Imperial Manila. She also criticizes the PDP Laban draft. Uh, one, three sections on expenditure amendments when taken together simply puts greater concentration of power at the center relative to what is the case in our existing unitary system today. And plus other criticisms that the advocates of federalism should read avidly. On education, Guevara says that inequitable access to quality education can be addressed immediately by just two reforms. I submit that we have failed in human development, not because of the Constitution, but because we have not fully implemented it, especially in the provisions on social justice and human rights and on local autonomy. The Constitution is not the problem, it is part of the solution. Where are we going? PDP Laban admits that the shift to a the shift is a complex and lengthy process with these uncertainties. That is why its timeline to complete the shift is at least 11 and a half years, including one and a half years to enact a new regional and local government code that in effect is a revised 1991 local development code. If the plebiscite is held in May 2019, the transition will end at the earliest in 2013. During the transition, the incumbent local government officials, in other words, those elected in 2019, constitute the regional commission with both executive and legislative powers until the organic laws for each region are enacted and the regional officials are elected. That's the carrot for them to deliver the votes for the cha-cha train. A term of 11 years for 2019 According to the summary of the PDB Laban draft, we need, quote, popularly elected, effective, and decisive president, where, one, in the transition to a more centralized system of governance, to hold and unite the country and ensure that the transition to federalism will be successful, will also be the arbiter of disputes. Number two, 
We need that kind of a president to deal with powerful countries like China and the United States, as well as to effectively compete in a globalized world economy. We need that kind of a president who can address the numerous national security problems and natural disasters. We need him to ensure that there is no gridlock in our political system because a pure parliamentary system without strong political parties can be unstable. Remember that. It will take time to build strong political parties and we need a strong president to do that. I believe that the president being referred to is President Duterte. Don't you? I mean... <laughs> President Duterte has said that he would step, step down when the shift is approved in the plebiscite. That would be 2019, but his term ends in 2022. Can he resist the call that he alone can make sure that the shift will be successful? What if he dies before his time? He will be 85 by 2030. It has the same ailments of seniors like me. <laughs> Assuming as many of the farmers and indigenous peoples believe that his heart is truly for the poor. What will happen to the country with the constitution tailored to his personality, presence, and style of governance? That's the problem when we place our destiny in the hands of one person rather than on institutions. During the transition period, legislation will be enacted to enable the regions to develop the human and resource capability to stand on their own. As we said, 14 of the 17 regions cannot stand on their own because of lack of financial, organizational, and human and natural resources. I am not against federalism per se, but only at the right time for it when the preconditions for its success are present, namely a strong political party system and hence the dismantling of dynastic rule. It would be impossible to attend to these, two, to these preconditions while federalizing and changing the parliamentary system all at the same time. And a messed up structural change is virtually irreversible and may lead and the ruin of our democracy. I submit that there may be an alternative to an immediate structural change by 2019. The question is, if the regions can develop through legislation the competence, the financial and organizational capacity, and the human resources to qualify as a federal state, why the need for federalization now? Besides, federalization without sovereignty, as provided by the PDP level draft, is nothing more than an enhanced multi-level unitary system, which is already mandated by our constitution and only needs reforms through legislation, such as, for example, the equalization fund, the change in the sharing of the IRA, better design and coherent expenditure assignments, tax assignments, intergovernmental transfers and credit worthiness of subnational units. I doubt if the people outside Metro Manila are told that they may have to wait up to about 12 years from now to become a federal state with its benefits, if any, but have to bear the costs of the ship in the meantime, and that the decision on their capacity to become a federal state rests mainly on the federal government with processes that are more centralized than the present system. So instead of a premature structural shift to a federal parliamentary system, why not start enacting now the fiscal decentralization and other legislation that will already devolve more power and resources to the 14 poor regions and the LGUs below them? That may be a more productive exercise than a cha-cha with a grandstanding that is sickening. In addition, why not also enact an anti-dynasty law up to the fourth degree of relationship 
and applicable in 2019 elections to demonstrate the sincerity of our legislations about real change. Enacting laws against their own interest is the best way to earn the trust of our people. Once the dynastic system has been replaced by a strong political party system, the anti-dynasty law can be amended to apply only to a second degree relationship or even the removed data in the first place. If the reform legislations are not passed or do not work, they can keep on trying because the messed up reform through legislature, legislation can be corrected, unlike structural change. If the reform legislation and fiscal decentralization work, and the 14 regions are able to stand on their own, that would be the right time to consider a shift to a federal parliamentary system initiated by the regions from the bottom up Rather, rather than today from the up to bottom approach. That is really the better way to federalization. Strong states getting together to form a strong union that can stand up to our enemies and compete in a globalized world. In closing, may I say, however the bleak the situation may sometimes be, I believe in the following. There is a state's money in every politician, and it's up to us to find it in whatever way we can. After all, democracy is about dialogue and compromise, in which there is no room for purists. Number two. However, if that fails, we have a battle for the hearts and minds of our people, a battle in which education campaigns, legal activism, and intelligent advocacy are more effective than sloganeering and street action calling for people power upheavals which alienate the moderates who are still deciding which side to support. We, we must not only be well-meaning, but we must also be correct in our cause if we are to succeed. Next. The poor say that they rely only on themselves to improve their lives with the use of people power in their own communities. They will no longer risk the streets to serve the ambitions of others. This is the changing paradigm of people power. It's a good omen for the future. And there is also the challenge to make them believe that there is a place for them in a democracy of their own making. Because we need a new generation of leaders who come from the poor. If we, we, if we are ever going to have real change. On these premises, on these premises, it is time for a broad national coalition, and I welcome it, against the present moves to change the Constitution. We can do this. We can do this because, as a Pulitzer Prize winner says, the only way people lose power is when they think they don't have any. Thank you very much.